All right. So the, um, the first thing that's important tonight is when we talk about surgery for, for pancreas cancer and that's pancreas adenocarcinoma mostly, I will be talking about, um, we have to realize that that only applies to 20% of people. There is still, unfortunately, 80% of everybody diagnosed with a pancreas cancer that will not be able to undergo surgery. And so we'll have treatment that we consider non-curative. What non-curative means is that we cannot remove all the cancer and make somebody with like cancer free or has no evidence of cancer. In that setting, the mainstay of therapy is really chemotherapy. And I'm sure you have other sessions where you can talk about this in more details. Um, I'm just putting in my a little note about chemotherapy here, saying that there is act like good survival that you can achieve with chemotherapy and beyond that it can help control symptoms and it can help provide good time for people. So that's also something to consider and keep in mind. Now, when people are able to undergo surgery, so the 20, about 20% of uh, patients with pancreas cancer, the curative intent management will be based on both surgery and chemotherapy together. Um, this is just a survival curve. So one of the, the key clinical trials in pancreas cancer treatment, um, where we compare new treatments of chemotherapy after surgery. And essentially what you see is this red line here is the new treatments that was being tested. That's called fulfirinox. So those are people that had surgery and they had all good factors after surgery. And then they were, um, half of them had the new treatment, fulfirinox, and then the other half had the usual treatment, gemcitabine, which wasn't you know, very effective. That's why we're looking for new ones. And by with this new chemotherapy, what you see right there is essentially there is about like a 36% improvement in survival in the risk of surviving um, after cancer surgery and the chemo with that chemotherapy. So that's very important. And those are the best outcomes we've ever seen after surgery for pan pancreas cancer in the past decades. Uh, we had ne really, really never seen that level of survival before. And so that's why... I'm saying I'm going to tell you this is a, a key takeaway is that the best way to be treated with pancreas cancer when you can is surgery and chemotherapy. Uh, having the chemotherapy component is important. Chemo alone cannot cure the cancer. Surgery alone cannot cure the cancer. It's really about having both. The problem is often after a big surgery, like for pancreas cancer, Lots of people are not able to get chemotherapy for a number of reasons, including complications from the surgery. So people are too weak to have chemo. And so the best way to make sure you can receive both is to get chemotherapy before surgery. That way we know patients receive both components of the care before the surgery can make them too weak to receive chemotherapy. So you will hear surgeons and oncologists talk about this more and more these days. Um, and that is because Really, both components are necessary to achieve the best survival possible, and that the best way to be able to receive both components is to get chemotherapy first. And there is a number of studies ongoing on this as well. Now, now that that said, how do we decide who can have surgery and who should not have surgery? Um, and what can you expect? So when you see Surgeons, the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll make a comprehensive assessment, um, and that includes a clinical evaluation. So how are people doing? Uh, what is the support that they have around them? That sort of thing. Then we'll look at imaging, and most often it's a CT scan. We need some very specialized CT scan that allows us to see the veins, the arteries, and all the organs around, and also the organs at a distance, like the lungs, for example. Often, we're going to have to repeat CT scans. So the, CT, the original CT scans were not done in an institution that does lots of pancreas cancer and pancreas cancer surgery. We may need to repeat them because we need more specialized protocols that allow us to see all the details we need. And then the other thing we'll look at is blood markers. There is one tumor marker we have, which is called C199. Now, a word of caution about this. When it is very elevated, we can say, that is because of the pancreas cancer. If that marker is normal, it does not mean that somebody does not have pancreas cancer. There are a, a subset of pancreas cancer that do not secrete this marker. So it's helpful when it is elevated. When it is not elevated, it doesn't really mean a lot. Now, 
what are we looking for? I think to sort of understand what I'm going to be talking about about surgery, I figured we could look a little at at what uh, the anatomy is and how things are set in terms of the organs. <clears throat> so the pancreas is, you know, this organ that's located kind of the back of the belly in the upper part of the abdomen. Um, and we think about it a, a bit like a fish. And so the head of the fish, so the head of the pancreas is located under the liver. It is attached to duodenum, which is the first part of the intestine coming out of the stomach. And then from the head, it extends across the belly and the tail of the fish will be located on the left side, right under the spleen. Um, so it is attached to duodenum. The bile duct gets through the pancreas in the area of the head. So that's why often when there's a tumor there, there's blockage from the bile duct and people will become jaundiced or yellow. Um, that's the reason why. Everything also is very intricate. Like it looks very separate on this, on this chart, but when you look at it in real life, it is uh, extremely, extremely intricate. So that's why the surgery uh, needs to remove the vast majority of those organs when we go for this. This is in a little bit more detail because I wanted to show you the blood vessels that are located around the pancreas. So because it is at the back of the belly, it is sitting on the um, vena cava right here, which is the vein that brings back all the blood <clears throat> from the legs, from the belly towards the heart. There is the aorta right here. That's the big blood vessel that comes from the heart and will distribute blood throughout the entire body. And then there is those two vessels here. The blue one is the, what we call the superior mesentric vein or and the portal vein right under, it changes name. Um, and that is important because it carries all the blood from the, um, the intra-abdominal organs back through the liver and then to the heart. And then this here is called the superior mesentric artery. It feeds all the intestine. So it's very important to keep it. Uh, we need it to live and to, and to eat and to digest. So with that in mind, then we can talk about what, um, what we look for when we do that assessment. Um, what we will look for is see what is the extent of the tumor. So the way that cancer will spread, and my apologies if you've reviewed this in other sessions, but I figured it was important we talk about it again. Um, so initially, the, there is a primary tumor, there is a cancer that arises in the pancreas, and it grows locally and it can invade locally, meaning it can touch organs, it can touch the blood vessels we talked about, but it's still located in the pancreas, it's just growing directly around it. Then eventually it's gonna spread to lymph nodes. That's why we often talk about lymph nodes in cancer surgery, because it's the first relay where the cancer cells kind of escape the initial organ before they spread further. And once they spread beyond lymph nodes, it can go to other organs like the liver, the lungs, the peritoneum and so on. And that's when we have what we call metastases. Now, what are the different categories and how do we define what we can take out with surgery or not? So cancer of the pancreas that are confined to the pancreas, so it's only in the pancreas organ, are called early stage. And those are, to all intents and purposes, considered resectable. What this means is they're away from the blood vessels we talked about. They're away from the other organs around, and there is no spread to other organs. There is no metastases at a distance. Now, when we see this, we're able to do surgery, and that's where like everybody would agree that this is something where surgery is feasible. And what we do is uh, what we call the Whipple procedure. So we remove the first part of the pancreas, the head here where the tumor is sitting. We remove the first piece of the intestine or the duodenum that's attached to it. And then we remove this piece of the, the bile duct as well because it goes through the pancreas like we talked about. So remove all those pieces and then we have to put things back together so we create three different connections the first one right here is between the bile duct and the intestine the second one is between the stomach and the intestine and then the third one between the pancreas and the intestine bear in mind that most people that have surgery for a cancer of the digestive tract will have one connection in this particular operation we make three so it's three times the challenge to heal, it, it's three times the energy needed to heal here. And what's interesting is when we talk about, you know, getting access and improving outcomes is this is a surgery that's accepted for early stage, like I mentioned. So this stage one is early stage, but not everybody gets it. And there's different reasons for that, but 
Sometimes it's also because it's not offered. The good news story on this graph, so this is from the United States, but you could have a very similar graph in Canada, is that you see in the blue line that the rates of people who have pancreatectomy, so who have surgery for early stage where it is very well accepted that that's the best treatment, that it can be well tolerated and leads to good outcomes, um, has been increasing. And the rate of people who don't get surgery as a result has been decreasing. But it still plateaus around like just above 50%. So it's not 100% of patients who get it, which is understandable. Not everybody would want to have surgery. It's not in everybody's wishes or values or goals of care. Um, but 50% is quite low. And what we've noticed is that in about 36% of patients who don't get surgery, there is no reason that's documented. So we don't know it's because the patient said no. We don't know it's because the surgeons consider that the patient was medically too sick to be able to go through the operation. There's just no real reason there. And potentially it's because it was not offered. And that is very important because receiving surgery when you have very early stage cancer like this makes a huge difference. So what you see here and goes to a little bit what I was talking about before, this is the percentage of survival of people after surgery for pancreas cancer. So the green line is the best one. So it's pancreas, you have surgery and chemotherapy. In the blue line, you have only surgery. And then the purple line and the red line is where like it's the survival is really not as good. Those are the people who don't get surgery. Um, and so not offering surgery in that setting uh, can lead to a lot of you know loss of, of months lived and loss of outcomes for, for people. So it's important to make sure that at least it is discussed and offered. And then if some people don't want to have it, that's totally reasonable, but I think it's important that the opportunity for care is there. And this is what I mentioned, like in 36% of patients where they don't have surgery, we cannot know, we don't identify the reason why, and probably it's because it was not offered. And whether surgery is offered or not depends on the hospital that people will go to. It can change up to sixfold depending on where you go. And that really depends on the volume of the hospitals. So hospitals that treat higher volume of patients with pancreas cancer will offer surgery more often. And then the survival in those hospitals will be better. So where you go is important um, in terms of make sure you have access to the right treatments. So that's for the ones that are like upfront, early stage, confined to pancreas. We know that they're resectable. Now, what about um, what we call locally advanced? So what locally advanced means is that the tumor has grown beyond the pancreas itself. So it hasn't spread to other organs, but locally it has grown beyond just the pancreas. So it's either touching or encircling the main blood vessels, touching or invading into other organs. But again, in this setting, no spread beyond the pancreas. So what happens and what can we do with surgery when we're in that situation? When it's only the vein, so remember we talked like the, the, blue, the blue part, so this um, super mesentric vein or the portal vein, if it's only that piece that is involved, we can potentially remove it. There is a little bit more surgery risks, but if we can remove it, we can provide benefits and we can remove the entire cancer with clear margins. And then we put it back together. That's what you see in them. Um, in those little diagrams in B and C, those are just different ways of doing that. So when it's the vein, we can do it. And I would say most centers uh, in Canada will do this now. What is more challenging, and when we look at what we call locally advanced borderline resectable, you might hear those words. So what happens is that when it touches the artery, so it's not only the vein now, you have something that touches the artery, the one I, I told you like we need because it feeds the entire intestine. So when it, when it touches the artery over less than 180 degree, we consider it's borderline resectable. So what this means is potentially we could remove this. Um, and the way that we, we would do this is <clears throat> would take the tumor off <clears throat> of the artery potentially. When we do that though, we'll often start with chemotherapy and we'll talk about why. Now, when locally advanced, it's considered unresectable. So something we cannot remove with an operation, 
is when we will touch the artery over a hundred, it's more than 180 degree around the artery, or when the vein is involved in a way that we cannot put it back together. Either the segment is too long or there are too many blood vessels we'd have to repair. So when we see that, the question we often get is, okay, that's what it is now, but could we make it resectable? Like, can we change the tumor so that you could do surgery in the future? And the answer to that is, yeah, maybe. Sometimes we can do that. How does it work? Well, first, we have to start with chemotherapy. Um, to make something resectable, we'd have to start with chemotherapy and then reassess with CT scans and see what a tumor is doing. When we give chemotherapy like this, the tumor will respond, meaning a tumor will shrink in only one out of three patients. And within those one out of three people, in order to make something that was not amenable to surgery, now amenable to surgery, the shrinkage has to be in the right spot. The problem is I would love to, you know, for the tumor to listen to me and to shrink exactly where I needed to peel away from the blood vessel. Doesn't often listen to me. And so it's less than 30% that will eventually become resectable even after chemotherapy. But we need to start with chemotherapy. Could we push the envelope and do more complex operations? I told you we can remove the vein. Um, can we do the same with the artery? The question is, the answer is sometimes we can. It's pretty rare. It's not done in a lot of centers. And the reason it's not in a lot of centers is because it's very high risk. There's lots of complications associated with it in the short and the long term. We also know that once the cancer starts wrapping around the artery like this, it spreads much more faster in the future and it comes back much more faster. So we would put people through higher risk procedures for less reward because the survival is not as good. So we have to carefully, carefully pick the patients for that so that we know that we're going to get through good outcomes. Because the last thing we want to do as cancer surgeons is put somebody through a really big operation with big complications, a long recovery, and then as soon as we're done, the cancer is back. So we have to really select to make sure that if we put people through this surgery that is very difficult for them to recover from, we know that it will be beneficial for them, or at least we, our best estimate is that it will be beneficial. So it is feasible, it's, very, it's rare, it's highly selected, always after chemotherapy, we always have to shrink and test with chemotherapy first. And it is isn't only in a few centers where they have a lot of expertise. It requires lots of expertise to be able to do those and to do them well and to do them safely. So I don't think it's, it's um, realistic that all pancreas surgeons will do this. Um, in Toronto, we have one surgeon who does it and does it very well. And we send him all the patients that are candidates for this um, so that he can maintain the expertise. Now, we talked a lot about resectability and the assessment. I just wanted to bring this up so you know, um, if you have to deal with it, that the assessment depends on the hospital you go to. There is a very, very interesting studies that have been conducted. The first one is to see at who is considered resectable and the treatment intent. So that means that they ask the doctors, like the whole multidisciplinary tumor board where all the different cancer doctors sit together and review cases. And they said, tell us if this is resectable and then tell us what's the intent of treatment. Is it to cure the cancer or is it not to cure the cancer? And there was huge variation amongst like seven different hospitals. That's all done in Europe when they showed them the exact same images and the exact same patient stories. Similarly, <clears throat> When you look at CT scan and you ask different people whether something is locally advanced, you know, I, I told you the, the big lines, but we have very specific criteria. And despite that, if we ask like different people if something is locally advanced, we can see huge variation, up to 50% discordance. So what this means is that it really depends on a multidisciplinary team in the hospital and their expertise. And there is more concordant, consistent assessments when you go to expert centers so centers that see a lot of patients with pancreas cancer. So it's important for the assessment. And I just wanted to say a quick word about um, in the metastatic setting, because we hear, we get that question quite a bit. 
Unfortunately, in pancreas cancer, as it stands right now, when the cancer has spread beyond the pancreas and, and the local environment and goes to other organs, like the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdomen, the liver or the lungs, surgery is not going to help. The cancer has gone beyond what surgery can help with. We're not able to break the cycle of the cancer with an operation. And if anything, if we put somebody with metastases through surgery, we're actually delaying the treatment that's going to help them. We're delaying chemotherapy. And to, in some way, we're probably harming those people by putting them through surgery. So that's not something we do at this time. Now, what does the surgery mean for recovery? Um, there's you know, risks of infection in the incision, the risk of bleeding and transfusions. But those are the ones that are like the main risks um, and they're particular to this operation. So the first one is a pancreatic fistula. What that is, is that there is leakage of the connection that we make between the pancreas and the intestine. And if that means that the connection doesn't heal well and the juices in the pancreas are flowing out of the intestine and building up in the belly, and that can make people quite sick. The way we'll treat that is we'll put in a small drain through the skin to get the fluids out while the body heals itself inside, that's temporary. But people can get quite sick from this. And there are some that may need to be fasting for a prolonged period of time to put the pancreas to rest. And in the most extreme circumstances, some people may need to go to the intensive care unit and manage with severe infections. Other thing that can happen is stomach paralysis, or if you, you hear the doctors talk about it, we say we call it delayed gastric emptying. Uh, what this means is we disrupt a little of the nervous system around the stomach when we do this operation. And so the stomach may not squeeze as well. And the only way to treat this is to wait it out, give it time to recover and to work again. And so what we do is we put a tube down the nose and inside the stomach to pump it so that people won't throw up. Um, and then we put the stomach to rest. So fasting, intravenous nutrition, and we have to wait. And it can take a few days, can take a few weeks. It depends on people. <coughs> Finally, there's always a risk of death with any surgery, but with surgeries this big, it's higher. So about four to 6% within the first three months after surgery. And the reason is that, and like, that's what I tell all my patients, like having surgery like this is like being hit by a truck. Um, it's a huge stress. It's a huge trauma for the body. So the heart, the kidneys, the lungs have to support the recovery. And sometimes it's just too much. And, and then uh, that's when if the body cannot heal the complications, if complications arise, then that's when death can ensue. So it's important to know. Of course, like those are average numbers. Like this really varies depending on the individual patient, the tumor, the extent of surgery, and so on. Other things that can happen more in the long term are diabetes. So 10 to 15% of people can develop new diabetes, can be treated with insulin fairly well. And then similarly, 10 to 15% can have um, what we call exocrine insufficiency. So that means not enough pancreas enzymes for digestion. And for that, we can just give um, supplements of pancreas enzymes. So what does a recovery look immediately after surgery? So there's a portion in the hospital and then there is one at home. Right after surgery, it's like approximately five days in hospital, including often like one night right after surgery in a monitored unit uh, so that we watch people more carefully. During this time, like the medical team will look after when people can eat, um, you know, adjust the fluids, manage vital signs and so on. One thing that patients and their families can do is exercise and mobilization, and that really, really uh, will contribute to recovery, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. The second piece is like after when people go home, um, there can be up to three months of recovery at home. That doesn't mean that that person will be bedridden. It just means that they're not themselves yet. To go back to a, like more normal energy level and feeling like yourself again, can take up to three months. Because one thing that we should not underestimate here is the need for rehabilitation of the digestive tract. And the way I, I say this to my patients in clinic is, you know, if I were to cut a piece of your leg, 
people would realize that you need to learn how to walk again. In this case, we're cutting out a big piece of the intestine, the stomach. You need to learn how to eat differently. So patients are going to enjoy food, eat and enjoy it, but it might be different and it might take a while for the body to get used to a new way things are. So, and I say that before and I say that after a surgery and I repeat it as often as I can, have to be patient, be patient with your loved ones who go through this and the patients themselves have to be patient with themselves, like give themselves time after surgery to heal. A quick word about exercises after surgery, because, you know, in an ideal world, I think we would have nurses and physiotherapists and everybody like getting patients out of bed three times a day and walking around and all that. The reality is our healthcare system is very strained right now, as you might all have noticed. And so we're not able to do that for everybody. So we're trying really to partner with families, with friends, with care partners to help patients get out of bed even more than, than what the medical team can help with. Um, so just, you know, helping with deep breathing exercises and coughing, getting up in chair for all meals, or even like if somebody is fasting at breakfast time, getting up in the chair, like using those times as reminders to get up and get out of bed can be very helpful. And you, we cannot underestimate how important those aspects of recovery are. And then this is just to illustrate the importance of giving people time. So we looked in Ontario at patient reported symptoms. So that's every time somebody comes into a cancer center in Ontario, they fill out this scale, asking them to rate nine symptoms that are common when people have cancer. And so we looked at thousands of those reports for all of Ontario over almost 10 years after a pancreatectomy. And what we saw is those symptoms like start quite high and then they will go down and they will stop stabilize at around three months. So that's where, when I said three months, that's where it comes from. And again, like this is me being very frank and honest with you. I've seen lots of my partners tell people, yeah, recovery is four weeks and you'll be fine. I don't think that's quite accurate. I'd rather set the expectations right so people know what they're getting into. And so this is, you see, for anxiety, depression, drowsiness, lack of appetite, and nausea. And we see a very similar pattern looking at pain, tiredness, well-being, and then shortness of breath. So just giving people time is very important. Now, I just talked about the outcomes of surgery. Um, and those differ depending on the hospital you go to. Um, this is data that's now like over 20 years old. Um, about how the volume of cases a hospital does will influence the mortality. That's from the United States. Similar data have been um, replicated in Canada, in Europe, uh, and in different settings. So what this means is, in this case, they saw that once a hospital does over six and over sixteen pancreas resection a year, the rate of mortality adjusted for differences in patients, differences in how healthy the patients are between different hospitals. When you take all that into consideration, there's a significant drop in mortality. And the center is that only less than one or one or two per year, up to 15% of people would die within a month of surgery. And when you do over 16, it dropped to 4%. That's huge. Like we have medications that don't perform that well. And, and that is also through, even in Ontario, where pancreas surgery can only be performed in nine, or sorry, now 11 centers. This is our data from Ontario. Even in Ontario, the very high volume centers perform better than smaller centers. So if you do over 40 pancreatectomy a year, the pa patients will have lower mortality at three months than the centers who perform less. So the expertise of the hospital is very important. And this is not related to me or to my colleagues as surgeons. I would love to think that we're the ones responsible for this and make me feel really good, but it's not the case. Um, this is about the team and this is about rescuing patients. So what failure to rescue means is when somebody has a complication, being able to treat that complication. 
and to rescue that person. If somebody has a big complication and then dies following the complication, we fail to rescue them. That's what we call failure to rescue. So hospitals that have higher volume of pancreas surgery are better at rescuing patients. That's why their mortality is better. So that's what you see here. You know, the high volume hospitals have lower complications. If you look at it the other way, low volume hospitals have higher complication rates than high volume hospitals, you know, about 1.7 times. But the mortality is even much higher than the difference in complication. And that is because it's not only about complications, it's about treating patients with those complications and, and saving them from it. And when you looked over time in the United States and in France about how outcomes have improved, we know there has been huge improves in, in death after surgery for pancreas cancer. And that is not related to my surgical technique being better. That is related to the entire team working together and rescuing patients with complications. So the reduction in mortality is really re, um, associated with a reduction in failure to rescue. And so, the other thing that's important with that is, you know, you can say, oh, well, that's fine, but you, we could have surgery in a smaller hospital. And then if there is a complication, we'll just go to be transferred to like a bigger hospital where they can rescue the complication. And they looked at this in France in particular. And what they realized, actually, when somebody is transferred to manage a complication, the risk of not rescuing them goes even higher. So like if you have to transfer, it's even worse than if you have a complication at the initial hospital, that's treated at the initial hospital. So it's important to have like, good surgical care at the initial point of care. So like where the patient is having their surgery is where you should have all the resources and the expertise to treat it from start to finish. And so that's why in Ontario, we've, um, they set minimum requirements for cancer surgery centers. Um, it exists for pedobiliary, so everything that's pancreas, liver, and bile ducts. It exists also for thoracic, head, and neck, and gynecologic cancers. Um, this is just one example of what Ontario has done. There's other ways to do this, but the idea is to say, to provide safe care and the best outcomes to patients, those are the minimum standards that people need to meet. And this is what is included in Ontario, so, you know, we need to have 24-7 access to uh, imaging, interventional radiology. So, you know, placing in drains, treating bleeding through the, like from inside the blood vessels, 24-7 uh, access to endoscopy. Like that, again, speaks to being able to treat complications. Intensive care units that can, again, treat those complications. And then those teams have to be expert in managing pancreas cancer surgery. So a minimum of 50 cases. And all liver and pancreas, so and pancreas, a minimum of 20 that is asked in Ontario. Um, so any center that does those surgeries in Ontario has to perform a minimum of 20 pancreas surgery. Some go exceed that vastly. My center does over 50 to 60 a year, but there is variation depending on the centers. They need to have at least two pancreas sur surgeons that have done additional training after being certified as surgeons in pancreas surgery and that are certified. So they need to have like a certification from an accredited training program saying that they are experts in pancreas surgery. Um, and then finally, the outcomes of those centers are also monitored. So for pancreas, um, those centers need to maintain a mortality rate at, at a month after surgery below 5%. And as I was um, preparing this <coughs> this week, there is... Um, because this is in Ontario, but interestingly enough, there is another paper that, that came out just this week. Uh, and this is the result of an international consensus. So they surveyed liver surgeons and pancreas surgeons around the world to ask them, what, is, what, what are the core criteria to provide safe and quality care for patients who want to go pancreatectomy? And I summarize them here and you'll see it's very similar to what Ontario has done in the past like 15 years at least. Um, so you need to have minimum two trained pancreas surgeons 
on-site availability to a lot of ancillary services to be able to treat people. You have to maintain a minimum volume at the hospital level, and you have to have specialized multidisciplinary tumor board. Again, speaking to what I showed you at the beginning, which is the assessment and whether we decide to resect or not depends on who assesses the patients. And so we want to have expert people assessing and people who do a lot of those assessments. At this, the process is just about how we dictate and we, we maintain our documentation. And in terms of outcomes, they recommend that repeat intervention rates, so return to surgery, radiology interventions, endoscopy interventions be monitored. Again, that speaks to the ability to rescue patients, the rate of complication, the rate of mortality, and in pancreas in particular, the rate of fistula be monitored to ensure that quality is maintained across the centers. And so I think that what is important here is often when we talk about doing high volume or having specialized center, we always think, oh, like everybody's going to have to go to the big cities to get their surgeries done. That's not what it means. What it means is you can have specialized centers that are close to people's homes so long as they maintain those criteria. So there can be a lot of specialized centers, but they have to maintain a minimum standard to be able to provide good care. And so I think I'm gonna stop here, but just um, the summary would be that surgery for pancreas cancer is really the cornerstone of having a chance for cure. It's the only thing that can completely remove the cancer and aim to cure it. The reason I say aim to cure is because I can never say to somebody, by removing this cancer, I'm gonna cure it for sure. There is no 100% certainty. Um, this is a cancer that tends to come back, but the best shot we can give somebody is with an operation. When that operation is feasible based on the extent of the cancer. When surgery is feasible and indicated, it is best performed by specialized teams. The way we measure specialization and expertise is by looking at a number of cases and volume but it speaks to way more than that. It's just, it's the thing that's easy to measure. If you have surgery, expect a long recovery um, and support through that recovery will be critical to have good recovery. When we do surgery, surgery is nothing if it's not combined with chemotherapy. So, and the best way to make sure people receive both components is often to give chemotherapy before so we'll hear that more and more often. Some of you may be asked to participate in clinical trials on this. And then finally, just remember that while well, surgery, I think, can do great things, it's not right for everybody. It's not feasible for all types of tumors. It may not align with the wishes and the goals of every single patient, and we have to be cognizant of that and help people navigate through it. And with that, I'll just um, thank you for letting me speak for so long. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hallett. That was a wonderful presentation. I think really uh, informative. I saw lots of chats uh, coming through saying how great the presentation was, which is great. Um, so we'll now open up the floor for some questions. We did have a few people <coughs> ask um, a few in the chat. So I'll just read them out. Um, so even with metastases is, oh, sorry, if it is a small localized location, would pancreatic surgery not help in decreasing the overall metastatic tumor burden? So now you are dealing with the small metastatic lesion. Yeah, it's um, not really because even if we see a small metastatic lesion, like what we see is only the tip of the iceberg. We know that pancreas cancer is really a systemic disease. So even if we see it only confined to the pancreas, there's often cancer cells circulating all around already. That's why chemotherapy helps so much because chemotherapy treats those circulating cancer cells. So if we see a very small site of metastases in the liver, let's say, it can be very easy to remove. Like that's not complicated. The problem is that it won't help because if we see that site, it means that there's a lot more circulating around in the body and there is a lot more already establishing dead cells in other organs, but too small to be seen. And if we do surgery, what can happen is number one, during that time, that person doesn't get chemotherapy, which is really what's gonna kill those cancer cells. Surgery doesn't address cancer that circulates. And 
surgery can actually promote cancer growth. So the, the trauma and the stress from surgery can trigger cancer growth. So if we remove everything, it's good because we've removed everything. So there is no cancer to be growing because surgery promoted it. But if there is a lot of circulating cancer cells, then that can be a problem. So in the setting of metastatic pancreas cancer, surgery doesn't help. And I do strongly believe that as we know things right now, surgery actually can harm people. Um, maybe in the future, as we develop better treatments uh, for those circulating cancer cells, it will become possible. That's what happened in colorectal cancer. Uh, but we're talking probably years, if not decades in the future for pancreas. That's great. Thank you so much. Is there research uh, or data on the difference in surgical outcome in regional centers versus major centers? Um, if there is no data, do you know if anyone is working on this? So I think you did sort of touch on this, but. Uh. Yeah, so we know that high, so it's not like, this is a pet peeve of mine is I don't want to talk about regionalization. Like you might've heard the word regionalization often when you hear about these. Um, because regionalization sort of feels like you put everything in one place and you almost like take the care away from people. And, and I like, that's not a good concept. That's not a good way to provide care. We also know that like, if people get care closer to their home, they have more support from their family, their care partners, their friends and, and, and their community. So we wanna maintain care as close to patients as possible while having it safe. Um, so that's why I tried to talk about high volume center and specialized centers because those can exist close to patients. And yes, when we have those centers, if you meet those minimum requirements I showed you, there is better outcomes. And that's not even debated anymore. Like, I think what people debate is, they like surgeons in particular don't like being told there's things that they cannot do or that they should not do. Um, so in Canada, I think it's very well accepted. It's very well implemented. In the United States, it's a completely different ball game uh, where everybody wants to do everything they want. I think the message at the end of the day is if you are to have one of those really big operations, it's best to go to centers that perform a lot. Um, and some of those centers can be closer. Like there's one in, in Thunder Bay um, in, in Ontario, for example. So the Northern Ontario is covered. That's great. Awesome. Um, then we have another question. Is there a specific protocol for antibiotic use to protect patients before, during, and after the Whipple? And is it widely known? Yeah, that's a very good question. Very timely too. So yes, it, it, it exists and it is very well known. There's actually um, a big international multi-center trial that just came out about two weeks ago or a week ago um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that is um, looking at more extended antibiotic therapy. So it's the antibiotics we give at the time of surgery. So we give it before the incision and we continue giving them through the operation. We don't give antibiotics after that. There is no proof that carrying on antibiotic, like, like preventative antibiotics after surgery is over will improve outcomes. But what that new study showed and, um, is that if you have like a broader coverage of antibiotics, you have better outcomes. So now it's the standard of care. We use something called uh, piperacillin tezobactam. That's the name of the antibiotic um, for most patients. And it's a new standard of care based on that study. And I got to say, you know, that study was in multiple center. A lot of those centers were in Canada. So a lot of Canadian patients participated in that study and helped establish that, st that new standard of care that now everybody can benefit from. So that's really the power of participating in those studies. and. So maybe those were not your loved one. It wasn't you, but on behalf of like, thank you to all the other patients that participated because that's how we generate that evidence. Um, another question, uh, oops. If the Whipple is successful, lack of care and high observation units with lack of care sort of defeats the whole purpose. It's not really a question, but I don't know if you have a comment on that at all. Oh, sorry. What was the comment? I'm not sure. I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, if the Whipple is successful, lack of care and high observation units uh, with lack of care sort of defeats the whole purpose. So I guess they're talking about the failure to rescue. Um, yeah, I think one important thing is like, it depends what you mean by successful. And that's kind of something I struggle with. I haven't hear like what people ask me most often in clinic is like, oh, what's the success rate? 
And the answer is, well, it depends what you mean by success. Like if you mean by success, like you're going to get out of the operating room um, and go home, I can give you a rate. If you mean by success, we're going to remove all the cancer. Like once we get to the OR, it's probably 100, like close to 100%. If you mean by that, we're going to be able to cure and a cancer will never come back. The success rate is, you know, more closer to, to 20%. So, you know, successful depends on your definition. Um, but the important thing, if we define success as like having a safe surgery where we can manage complications, because what you have to realize is complications are going to happen. Even with the best of the bestest surgeons that's ever existed, there's going to be complications. Um, you know, one of my um, mentors told me one day, the only way never to have complications is not to operate. So um, the complications are going to happen. The important thing is to be able to manage them. And so that's where like you want those centers that are experienced in that aspect. Definitely. That's great. Um, is there any prevention for post-surgery fistula or post-surgery collection? Is good nutrition before surgery um, something that can help to prevent it? Yeah. So maybe I'll answer the, the second question first is, yeah. So good nutrition, <coughs> good performance status exercise or for surgery can definitely help. Like any little bit can help. There's lots of programs right now that are being implemented and studied called pre prehabilitation program. So it's like not, you know, we're used to rehabilitation, which happens after somebody had an injury or an accident. This is like prevention. So it's preventative exercise programs. It includes nutrition. It includes um, like wellness aspects, support um, socially and so on. And so, and those are showing more and more that they have an impact on the outcomes of patients. The problem is we're trying to figure out which one is the best of the prehabilitation programs and ways that they can be delivered to as many patients as possible with reasonable resources being needed and also for patients to be able to do it at their homes. Right? We don't want somebody to have to come to hospital every day for this. So that's what we're like. There's lots of studies. There is um, trials ongoing, including one that our center is going to start participating soon in. Um, so that's for the, the nutrition and everything else around it. And to prevent um, fistula, so I'm being, again, frankly honest, because that's the only way I know how to speak with people, is um, it's a very frustrating aspect for us as pancreas surgeons. There has been so many treatments that have been tested in clinical trials, and every single time, we cannot show a difference. Um, so many things, like glue, meshes, type of sutures, the way the pancreas is reattached to the intestine the drains that we put around, the medications that we give after. Like we've tried so many things. One thing has been shown to have an impact. Um, it's a, a drug called pastoreotide, which sort of dries out the pancreas um, secretions. Now, problem is the following. It's not available in Canada and is unlikely to become available in Canada because the company is not pursuing Health Canada approval. Um, so that's where we're limited right now. That's great to know. That's at least there's something out there. Um, we have thanks for a great presentation. I had doubts and questions regarding my treatment, but you've set my mind at ease. Um, so that's really nice. Um, thanks, Dr. Julie, for this excellent, uh, very informative presentation. Mine is borderline resectable. It's encasing three vessels. So I have opted for SBRT radiation for now. Will I still have surgery option after the radiation? Um, so it's hard to say because I haven't seen the, the scans and all that. So it's always difficult. But in general terms, what I'd say is like when you have more than one vessel, um, it's much more challenging to make it to resection. Even the surgeons who do artery resection, so the ones you know, I said it's like uncommon to do, they will often do one vessel. When there is more than one involved, they become increasingly um, not anxious, not a right word, but like hesitant about it because like every vessel you add is like multiplying the risk of complications and, and then the benefits go down because the more vessels are involved, the more risk there is of the cancer coming back after. Um, so, you know, in this balance of the risks and benefits, if you add number of vessels, the balance is shifting quite a bit. Um, the way that it could become resectable is if it responds to SBRT. Um, 
it would require, we can never say never is what I always say, but it would require a very, very extensive um, response. So it, but the good news is SBRT is a really good local treatment. It provides excellent local control, meaning like prevents a tumor from growing and creating trouble and really can prolong survival when in combination with chemotherapy. So it's, it's a really good treatment when it is feasible. Awesome. That's great. Um, another question here. Uh, why, why is there a need? Sorry, why, why is there a need to remove um, all pancreas and half of stomach on borderline resectable cases? Um, so half of the stomach. So in general, it, not only for borderline resectable, but for like all whipples, we remove about two centimeter of stomach. Like we do what, like now what we call stomach preserving procedures. Um, the old school Whipple, like a few decades ago would have removed half the stomach for everybody, but now we remove only two centimeter. Um, with regards to removing half the pancreas, it's not necessarily with regards to resectable or locally, resect or locally advanced. It's really about what a tumor may look like. So if you have more than one tumor, if the tumor is like infiltrating through the whole pancreas, or um, sometimes depending on the type of diagnosis, it may be required to remove the entire pancreas. That's very individualized um, depending on, on the tumor characteristics. Okay, great. Um, the surgery was highly advised for my main duct IPMN, which turned out to be uh, pan uh, IN1. I have struggled tremendously with recovery. What are your thoughts on Whipple's <laughs> precancerous IPMNs? Um, the thoughts are that that's one of the only options we have to ever prevent pancreas cancer. Uh, pancreas cancer is, you know, there's no screening programs, as you all know, because we don't know how to screen for it. The only way we know how to screen and prevent it is in patients with IPMNs or other types of pancreatic cysts as well um, that are transforming. If we see a high, an IPMN or a pancreas cyst that is changing, that is an opportunity to prevent a pancreas cancer. So, you know, pan in one would have probably transformed into a pancreas cancer over time. Um, so from my perspective, when we have high-risk IPMNs or mucinous cysts, um, that's when we have the most benefit out of a Whipple because we can actually prevent a cancer. Um, and that doesn't happen often. That's great. That's good to know. Um, all right. Does anybody have any other questions? Um, feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat if you do. Yeah, so with regards to IRE in particular, it is more available in the United States. It doesn't mean that it it, it should be, um, is my bias. It's, um, you know, th there's a lot out there that people are, are talking about. It doesn't mean that it makes that much of a difference and there can be quite significant drawbacks. Um, we've been, we've treated patients who had IRE out of country when they come back and have their complications. Um, it's quite challenging. Um, I think like everything, it, things have to be tested in clinical trials. One of the issues with IRE is it was not, um, it was kind of adopted and, and we, we don't know whether it helps or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so things that are currently being tested in clinical trial, the first one is the sequence of chemotherapy. So, you know, doing chemo followed by surgery, followed by more chemo. Um, that's going to, like, there's a trial called for new edge, and I can't remember the exact name, but it's run by the Alliance um, study group that's gonna open in Canadian centers uh, momentarily, like I'm talking weeks, uh, where we're gonna enroll people in the new adjuvant trial. So chemo, followed by surgery, followed by more chemo versus surgery upfront, followed by chemo. So that's one. Um, another one is that we're gonna start as soon as we get all the approvals at our center. It's led by uh, Paul Karen Nicholas, one of my colleagues, about what we call high fuse, so high intensity focused ultrasound um, that we will deliver in the pancreatic tumor at the time, mm -hmm. like intraoperatively, so that so. to trigger more response. Other trials that are ongoing are using radiation therapy preoperatively to try to shrink the tumor 
Now, there has been a lot of those types of trials over the years that have not shown like definitive results, but people keep trying to tweak the type of radiation therapy to find a benefit. So that's ongoing. And then there is a lot of interesting work done, especially out of Boston um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital about intraoperative radiation therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So that you can, and which personally I find might have more potential in the future than IRE. Um, so it's like you resect the tumor, you skin the blood vessels to get all the cancer and the tumor out. And then you deliver radiation therapy in the field um, to kill any like leftover cancer cells um, in, in locally advanced cases. So there is that coming up as well. Any centers in the GTA or Ontario that do lap uh, laparoscopy in pancreatic cancer cases? And what is your opinion on ablation? Um, so for laparoscopy, it, it depends on what cases. So I'd say for um, the, the left part of the pancreas, so like resection of the tail of the pancreas, I think most centers in Canada will do that. Um, for the central pancreas, some centers will do it, including our center. And then for Whipple, I think that that's, uh, um, that's a very controversial issue. There was uh, one surgeon in um, in Toronto, uh, so Shiva Charaman, who did it, and I know that he's like let go of that practice um, because of uh, different issues. And I'll talk to what what are the potential drawbacks of laparoscopic whipples. I know mm -hmm. there is a program uh, where they're doing it in London, and then uh, some um, one center at McGill in Montreal. Um, the issue is the problem with the whipple, like like we looked at, like I showed you, is that it's a pancreas fistula. That's what creates most of the complications. That's what creates most of the mortality from the surgery. That's what creates most of the delayed recoveries. And laparoscopy doesn't change that risk. So in, you know, in surgeries like a colon cancer surgery where like the difficulties in recovery and the complications come from the fact that people have a really big incision, then doing something laparoscopically makes a lot of sense. For something where the morbidity, like the complications do not come from the incision, but comes from the inside of the surgery, doing it by laparoscopy doesn't necessarily create, like solve the problem and you can still have a lot of issues. Also, the other thing, if you're looking at laparoscopic whipples is that the learning curve for surgeons to do it well and do it safely is extremely long. So we talk like one surgeon has to do over 50 cases 50 laparoscopic whipples to become proficient. Um, mm -hmm. that's a, and in most Canadian centers, that's not realistic. So there is a lot of centers, including mine, where we have made a conscious decision to not do laparoscopic whipples. Um, and that's that would be the majority of, of Canadian centers at, at this time. I was trained, I learned how to do them and elected not to do it for those reasons. Sorry, I hope that that's a long answer back to that helps. So that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, and so sorry, I know we're a little bit over time here. Uh, we have one more question. Um, can I ask what are your thoughts on the KRAS inhibitors being developed in particular G12D? Um, we're seeing many different companies working on oral treatments now. Yeah. So uh, for pancreas, I don't know how much there is yet at this time. Um, KRAS G12C is being targeted in clinical trials in colorectal liver metastases. Uh, there is one clinical trial that is open in Canada right now on this. Um, I don't think that it's reached that level for pancreas cancer at this time. I think we have to understand that in, in pancreas cancer, it's been also, again, very frustrating because a lot of what we see in other diseases doesn't pan out. Like all the immunotherapy, all the targeted therapies, that have done very well in other cancers don't work as well in pancreas. We don't fully understand why as of now, lots of people are working on it, um, but we're, we're, not, um, I, we're, we're not there yet for this one, not for pancreas. Yeah, so often when there's uh, metastases, it's because cancer cells had left the pancreas before it was removed. And, and so that's why, you know, that's why when I said chemotherapy with surgery is very important is to kill those cancer cells that are circulating to reduce the risk of them nesting into an organ and creating a new tumor there. Um, it's never 100% effective, unfortunately. 
And so that's why we're working a lot to try to prevent this in pancreas cancer. Because we, if we knew that by doing surgery, we would provide people with a very, very, very long interval with no other cancers showing up, we could be even more aggressive with our surgery. The prime right now is just a cancer that tends to come back. So we try to, you know, balance this risk and, and benefit with it. So as we develop new treatments that are going to be more effective at killing those cancer cells, hopefully we'll be able to push the envelope more with surgery. It sort of goes hand in hand. But yeah, the answer is those cancer cells had already left the pancreas before surgery occurred. And we have no way of seeing them. That's the problem, right? If we knew, uh, we could make even better tailored treatments. So clear cell carcinoma would be a, oh, yeah. a, a rare subtype of pancreas, can, of pancreas cancer. Um, <clears throat> you know, the most common is adenocarcinoma. Mm -hmm. And you can have squamous cells and clear cells. Um, it, what it means, it doesn't necessarily respond the same way to the chemotherapies we know about. The prognosis mm -hmm. is not exactly the same. It's not super common. Like clear cell is one where I would have to go back and check like how okay. they fare compared to adenocarcinoma. Okay. I know like a, a thinner cell fares worse than adenocarcinoma. Um, squamous, we don't have a lot of treatments against. So it, like they're all a bit different, but they're rare types. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Hallow. This was a wonderful presentation. I think we all learned a lot and uh, okay. you know have a lot more information now. So thank you so much for coming out today and for doing the presentation for us. Um, really